Okay, let's look at Isaiah 42. So in Isaiah 42, Isaiah was written about 2,700 years ago. And in Isaiah 42, there's this theme that's developed starting in chapter 41 all the way into the Isaiah uh, fit chapter 50s, right? It's, and it's about the servant of the Lord. It's about the servant of the Lord. Now, what's interesting here, we'll read a couple uh, verses here in chapter 42. He says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, so I've, I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice or make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. But he will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. And so Isaiah is looking ahead, and he's prophesying about a servant that would come. Now, the servant, the, the purpose of the servant here is to bring justice into the earth. We see it three times here in these first four verses. In verse 1, it says, my servant, he will bring forth justice to the nations. Right? Verse 2, he will bring forth justice, right? Or is it? In verse 3, he will, he will faithfully bring forth justice. In verse 4, he says, he will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And so there is this cry or this righteousness in the heart of God to bring forth justice into the earth. What that means is that there's injustice in the earth right now. Because of sin and the penalty and the wages of sin, there's actually injustice in the earth. So much so that the Father says, I will raise up my servant and my servant will come forth and will not stop until he establishes justice in the earth. This actually passage or, or the desire, the purpose of God uh, correlates with Isaiah 11 as well, about what the, the servant will do in Isaiah 11. He's not called a servant but in Isaiah 11, but that's really the, the coming of Christ with the sevenfold spirit. And so here in chapter 42 now, there's this twofold identity about the servant. The question is, who is the servant? Okay? Who is the servant? And, and it's answered both ways contextually, Okay, con contextually, uh, starting in chapter 41, the servant is meant to be the nation of Israel. The servant is meant to be the nation of Israel. Now later, uh, if you look here, I think it's in the notes, yeah, chapter 41, verse 8 and 9, he says, but you Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, and he goes on. And in other chapters, 43, 44, 47, 49, uh, it's talking about the servant, and it's meant to be the nation of Israel. And if here, when you look in uh, verse 7 or verse 6 of Isaiah 42, he says, he says uh, you, I will appoint you as a covenant to the people and as a light to the nations. Meaning, the purpose of Israel as a nation was to show forth the revelation and the knowledge of God, and they were to be a light to the nations. They were to experience show and express the relationship of what uh, they could have with God and the nature of who God was, okay? So contextually, it's Israel. Mo in most of the passages actually here, it's Israel. But the servant is also Jesus Christ himself, okay? It's also Christ himself, right? And so prophetically, it's Jesus. Contextually, it can be Israel, the nation, now, in Matthew 12, right, it's, on, it's on here, so look, Matthew 12, uh, Matthew's talking about Jesus and what he's doing, his ministry, and in chapter 12, he goes and he quotes Isaiah 42 here about the servant, okay? In chapter 12 here, it says, uh, verse 17, it says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, behold, my servant whom I have chosen, and he's quoting Isaiah 42, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. And he just goes on, he's quoting the first four verses of Isaiah 42. Okay? That tells us 
that in the first coming of Christ, his purpose was actually to bring justice to the nations and to bring justice into the earth. And the way he does it, justice can look, um, uh, have different ideas in our day, but I believe justice has two primary applications. One is spiritual justice, and two is actually a physical, literal justice that happens. And what happens is when Jesus came, he actually brought forth justice the first in his first coming, but he didn't fulfill it, and he will not fulfill it until his second coming. Meaning, when he came, we're coming up on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday, right? Is when he came, he actually bore and paid for the penalty of sin in his own body, and he laid his life down as a sacrifice for the penalty of sin, for the payment of sin. And in doing so, everyone who believes upon his name and, and asks for forgiveness and repents, they're washed and they're born again. They're washed of their sins and they're born again. It's a gospel message. But this gospel message actually brings, is a spiritual justice that we can be washed of our sins and we're born again by the Holy Spirit. Right? It's called justification by faith, Romans chapter 4. We've looked at it many times. And what happens in salvation is our spirit man gets saved first, in a sense, because we receive his imputed righteousness and our spirits are, made, are born again in perfect righteousness. Right? And yet, our physical bodies still are under the penalty of sin and the curse of sin, and we don't receive the fullness of his justice or the fullness of our salvation until we, re- until we see him face to face And then our bodies, we will receive glorified bodies when we see him. And so there's a spiritual salvation. There's sanctification where we're made into the image of Christ, which is ongoing. And then there's the future salvation. When we see him face to face, this mortality will put on immortality. We'll receive the same body that Christ had that will never suffer. And so our salvation is actually we were saved when we said yes and we repented. We're being saved right now as we're being sanctified, made into his image, and yet we will be saved in the future when we see him face to face, and all those are true. And so when we look here, we say, Jesus, what was his mission and purpose? It was to bring justice, salvation in the spirit first, in his first coming. When he returns, what will he bring? He will bring justice into the earth physically, Meaning, what we'll look at later is this, he will bring judgment on sin in the natural realm to remove sin because justice is making wrong things right, and he will remove the things that are wrong by his judgments. In Revelation 19, when he comes, he actually comes with a sword in his mouth, and he comes and brings judgment on the earth. Though he brings salvation as well, he rescues both Israel and his people, the church, and so he brings, he comes with judgment to remove the things that are wrong, and then he establishes everlasting righteousness into the natural realm. Right? And that's the, that starts in the millennial kingdom for a thousand years, and then for all of eternity. And in that time, it says there's no more pain, no more tears, right? There's no more suffering. Why? The natural realm will receive the fullness of his righteousness, which will be established just like in our own bodies. There's a parallel with the salvation that he gives to us that will happen in all of creation. And that's why it's called, we're looking for the new heavens and the new earth. Okay? First Peter and Isaiah 66. There's a new heavens and a new earth that's coming to be established on this earth. Right? And he will bring forth justice and righteousness into the natural realm. Are you following me? I'm t- this is all to set up God's master plan. So, but we have to understand this because this is his prophetic mission. His prophetic mission, which he started in his first coming, and the prophets from the Old Testament didn't understand that there would be two comings. They, they were looking, going, the Messiah, the servant, he will bring justice into the earth. That's his, that's his express goal. Well, how will he do it? Okay. The first coming is he'll bring a spiritual justice, salvation, And then in his second coming, he'll establish 
He'll confront the oppressors of the earth and injustice of the earth. He will openly confront them, remove them by judgment, and then establish his truth and righteousness into the nations. And so this is his prophetic mission. All right, you guys with me? Okay, good. So letter, page two, letter E. The, the, uh, the prophetic plan of God is revealed here. And in and, and the first four verses of Isaiah 42, we see what God wants to do, and he's using the servant to bring justice. In verse 5 and 6 here, in verse 6, he says, uh, he, says, he says, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And he says, and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people and as a light to the nations. And the way he will bring justice is that Jesus himself will be given as the covenant to the people and that he will be a light to the nations. Meaning the justice that will come forth is actually rooted in him being the covenant or really in his incarnation, in his death, and in his resurrection. That foundation of the new covenant of his incarnation, of his death, and of his resurrection, which really is the new covenant that he's made, that's how we're saved. That foundation of the covenant is, the, is the, the source of all justice that will be established in the earth, right? Meaning his incarnation, and I was thinking about this as we're singing it tonight, is, is when we say, you know, God became a man, his incarnation, beloved, we have to receive oh, that truth of the incarnation. If we can't receive and celebrate and worship his incarnation, we actually have no part with him. It's what he's saying in John chapter 6. He's saying, unless you eat of my blood, drink of my blood, eat of my flesh, you have no part with me. What is he saying there? Because the incarnation is not man asking God to come and save us. The incarnation is God's love and his loving kindness and his mercy saying, I'm coming to rescue you. We didn't ask God to come. God says, I'm coming to deliver you from the plight of sin and the oppression of sin. And to do so, he says, I, God, eternal God, will take on the form of a man. We celebrate that at Christmas time, but honestly, it's the foundation of the revelation of the heart of God going, I'm coming to deliver you in your sin and weakness. You don't have to come and ask me. Like, we didn't ask. The mankind didn't ask God, God, come and help us, help us, help us. Right? God says, no, no, no. You can't help yourself. I love you. I want to show you that, and I want to deliver you. And so God took on the form of a man to come and to give himself as a ransom for many. And if we don't understand that foundation, like we do when we say yes to Jesus a little bit, but the depths of that, says we cannot receive from the heart of God. It starts in the place of the incarnation. And so, and so when we see this, I mean, the, the justice and the righteousness that he wants to establish on the earth, it begins at the, at the incarnation, the, his death, his, where he laid down his own life, and then at the resurrection where the father validates his sacrifice and he raises him from the dead. That, that death and sin could no longer hold him. I mean, this is who our Jesus is. <coughs> All right, so the, the role, letter F, so the role of the servant is that he is, the, he is appointed as a covenant or as the covenant for the people. And this is how he's going to do it. All right, let's turn to page three. And so here in verse nine, and we're only gonna look at a few verses, but in verse nine, he's, we, so the plan of God, just to re, uh, reiterate it, is he's, he's the servant will bring justice into the nations. And he's going to do it through the cross and resurrection. And then in verse 9, he says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. And he says, Now I declare new things. Meaning there's something new that's going to come on the earth as part of this plan. Okay, there's something new that's coming. And in verse 10, he begins to list what this new thing that God is going to do in the earth. Okay? And just think, follow my thing. I was like, because God could create anything in the earth. I mean, in Genesis 1, he spoke and everything we see he created. By grace, we're saved 
it's, it's, we say yes, but it's his like leaning, leading and his spirit that brings understanding and conviction and drawing. We're saved by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Okay? And so God could create anything in the earth that he wanted to. Right? So he has a blank slate. And he goes, I'm going to do a new thing in verse 9. And in verse 10, here's God's primary strategy in verse 10 for the nations so that salvation will come to the nations. You know what it is in verse 10? It's singing. He says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. And you go, you go God, you could create anything you wanted on the earth and your primary strategy to, to, to confront sin, eradicate sin off the earth, and to bring in the, the next age to come, the millennial age, he goes, is singing? Like, this is his primary strategy, is that the nations would sing. It's what we were doing tonight. And you go, you could do anything. And I go, and this is what you want to do. You want to produce, it's not just singing. He wants to, he will produce a singing church or a singing bride out of all the nations. A bride that sings. This is his strategy. It should tell us so many things going, God's value system and our value system are totally different. I mean, if we want to take over the nations, we would... Ask for a military, money, <laughs> authority, finances, favor. I mean, like, how do, would we take over the nations? It wouldn't be a group of people singing. Right? Like, what does singing do? And from God's perspective, he goes, you don't understand the most powerful things in the earth is a singing bride, a singing church. Because, so we talk about the, the worship and prayer movement that God's been establishing over the last 25 years. It's because we don't understand that the government of God does not operate the way that men, that the men's government work. We need authority. Uh, we need not authority. We need power. We need money. We need military. We need people. And God says, I have all that. I have all that. What I, the way God's government works is this. I need priests in the, the church to agree with me. And in worship and in prayer, I will release all that I have into the earth. And the way God's government operates is totally different than the way we operate. We're like, we can't do it because we don't have resources. And God goes, I have all the resources. You need faith to do what I'm telling you to do. You don't need more money or more connections. You need the faith to believe me and to agree with me and then to obey what I'm saying. Totally different. We go, how am I going to build my business? How am I going to raise the money? How am I going to do this? How am I going to make connections? He goes, you don't need to do that. That's how our system, the world system operates. And God goes, no, my kingdom's different. And he goes, for me to establish and to transition the earth into the age to come, he says, I'm raising up a singing bride out of all the nations. Right? This is his primary strategy. Now, let her see here, just to go, because this, when we look at it, I'll just, I'll just summarize it. The singing bride from, chap, from verse uh, 10 to 12 calls, the Lord responds to the singing church of the nations by returning in verse 13, and then in verse 14 and 15, he brings his temporal judgments. Meaning he responds to the singing church, the singing bride. And his response is he makes war against our adversaries and he establishes righteousness. That's how he does it. Okay. Now, the, the amazing part is, is this. In verse uh, 10 and 11 here, he actually lists five challenging regions that will sing or bear fruit. I think it's the five most challenging regions. And it's here, it's, it's the areas of the seas or the islands, the coastlands, the wilderness, the settlements of Kedar and Selah, and the mountains. Okay, five different regions or challenging regions in the nations because the gospel's only gone into about half of the earth right now. And we know that the gospel must go into every nation before the Lord comes. It's Matthew 24, 14. 
And the picture that we see here is going, the gospel will go into every nation because all the nations will sing. Okay? For all the nations to sing, that means there has to be a church established in all the nations. It means that the gospel has penetrated the hardest areas against every oppressing government and, and, and false religion of Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and everything else. The gospel has prevailed through that, that there would be a people for Christ as his inheritance from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Right? This is what's going to happen. Right? This is what the, really the, the focus and, and, the, and the mandate on, our, on this generation, so you young people, right? It's, it's not probably our generation. It's your generation. The mandate on your generation is you are a missional generation that will carry the triumph of the cross into every nation. Because it must happen. It's what the Lord's highlighting right now uh, so that he can return. Okay? Uh, there's so many other things to be said. I mean, that's, that's, that's a really brief summary statement. But he's listed these five areas. You know there's around 12,000 islands in the earth right now? There's about 12,000 islands that the gospel must go to. Okay? There's all these coastlands, the wilderness. But in this, and what I want to highlight tonight is, he says in verse, uh, verse 11, he says, The settlements where Kadar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing aloud. Out of all the different areas of the earth, all of a sudden, what does he do? He highlights this one area, Kadar and Selah. Now, in, if you look in page four, we have some nice little maps. <laughs> okay? And here, Kadar and Selah, Kadar here is the second son of Ishmael and was part of the, of the League of Tribes in the Arabian Desert. And so they spe specifically dwelt in the northwest of Arabia. And so if we look at our map, well, you can see here it's a little bit truncated, but you have Israel, and then you have Jordan, Saudi Arabia, it's in, and you see here this kind of square thing here. Those are the best guesses about around where, where Qadar is or where they settled. So it's, if you see, it's a lot of Jordan, okay? But you'll, it'll touch into, you know, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, especially uh, in, in Saudi Arabia there. Um, and so it's specifically that area. But then Qadar could also be used as a collective name for the Arabs, for the Arab tribes. Okay, so it kind of is a general call or statement about the Arabs. Selah is really more localized in Jordan. Okay? And so think of what... Isaiah is saying here, and what God is saying, going, my servant will bring justice into the nations. He's going to do a new thing at the end of the age. And that new thing is the nations will sing. But he's saying, but for the, when the nations sing, he goes, there's a targeted area in which God will pour out his spirit, send his gospel through missionaries or laborers. He'll send out his, his uh, gospel and there will be a response that the church will be established in the Middle East. This is one of the primary areas, because when we look at the 1040 window right now, we've talked about this a lot, is, is most of the unreached people groups are in that 1040 window, specifically in the Middle East. And right now, when you look at Islam, there's 1.9 billion Muslims in the earth right now. 1.9. All right? That's probably a quarter of the earth, almost, okay? of, of Muslims right now. And out of that 1.9, 99.9% are unsaved. 99.9%. I mean, that's amazing. Okay? <clears throat> and so when you look around Israel, you have these different nations. And they're all Arabs. Right? We looked at, you look at Turkey. Uh, we're looking at, and you have this awesome prophecy about Turkey. I don't know how many million, I think Turkey has like 70-something million people, right? And, and Turkey is, was the place where the first churches in, East, in Asia Minor, the churches of Book of Revelation were established there, right? I mean, I think in Istanbul alone, there's, I think, 13 million people that live there, right? And so when you look, it's like, and you look at Turkey, it is 99.9% .9 unevangelized. 
or unsaved. Right? Every nation, right? I think uh, Egypt has about 90 million people. 90 million. Now, there's a good Coptic group there, but there's so many Muslims unsaved. Right? I mean, you talk about a, bil- a million people. That, uh, John was saying, like, they had a conference with, you know, they represent a million MVB believers, which is awesome. I mean, amazing. But when you take a million compared to 1.9 billion, I mean, a million is a drop in a bucket. Right? What's that? That's less than 1% of 1%. Right? Something like that of 1.9 billion. Right? I mean, that's what we're looking at right now. But the good news is this. We have the prophetic word made more sure, saying God's going to target the Middle East. Because you correlate this with Isaiah 19, and that's what's here, with ancient Assyria. And you see here, God's like, he will build a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And really, Assyria, when you talk about Assyria, it's, you're talking about northern Iraq, the Mesopotamian area, Iran, Turkey, and Syria. Right? That's right in this region. That's the heart of this region. And, God's, and I believe what he's highlighting in this generation is going... I'm going to accelerate my work in the Middle East. And he's got a big bullseye on the Middle Eastern nations and the peoples. And it's not how many don't believe. It's actually how many are going to come into the kingdom. And there will be a singing church out of these different nations and cities and villages and wilderness. It's not because we want it. It's actually because the word of the Lord prophesies it. It's what it declares. He says, in the Middle East, or those nations surrounding Israel specifically, he says, he will establish his church there, and they will sing to the Lord. They'll sing night and day. It's Malachi 1.11. From the rising of the sun to its setting, all these places, his name will be uh, lifted up in all these different cities and nations. And as it happens... This night and day worship and prayer movement that's going to be, it's in America, I think, it, it might have, uh, when you look at it, just when we look at it, it probably hit a high point in some ways and is, and is, and is shifting. Okay, it's actually, how, it's not house of prayers like this, what's growing. What's growing is communities of people praying, praying churches. Meaning, the, the, I think the thrust of prayer has gone forth and now it's shifting in different churches, which is great, right? But in other nations, you look and go, it is this idea of worship and prayer, it is going to escalate before the Lord returns. Okay? And because why? Because it is God's primary strategy. He says the nations will sing. And what happens is when we sing, I mean, even tonight, worship was so good. It's like, it's like an extension of your soul is just going up before the Lord. Right? And it really, we, in, in worship, we magnify the Lord. It's Psalm 22. We worship him. His throne, his presence, his authority comes. His name's established over the nations. It's your John chapter 12 saying, when he is exalted, he'll draw all men to himself. We we can exalt him through preaching, of course. But when we collectively worship, there's a unity. There's authority. There's a, he's looking for worshipers, John chapter 4, where he says it's not just, in, uh, just worshipers, but those who worship in spirit and in truth. Okay? And that's what happens when we give into worship together. It starts draw, lifting the name of Jesus and his presence, his authority, his administration, his, his, uh, his plan. It begins to come and become established over that region. And he says, and God knows that way better than we do. And he says, I'm going to... Bring forth my people out of all these places where you look and go, there's no churches there. There's hardly any believers there, right? Indigenous believers in some of these areas. I mean, some areas, they said, there's so many places that have 10 billion or 10 million uh, uh, Muslims, right? And no missionaries. I mean, so many cities have 10 million. And, um, And there's just no indigenous church there. And he says he's going to change that expression so that worship will come alive. The new song, the song of the Lord will come, and God will hear it, and he will move in response to the worship of the nations. 
This is his primary strategy. Right? At the end, at, and I believe really for this generation, I look in, uh, especially in the Middle East, there are so many young people. Demographically, there are so many young people there. Right? It's that God is raising up a generation that's going to worship the Lord. And I think for us, as we're older, and us on the West, even younger ones, going, God, what are you doing in my generation? What are you doing in my generation? And in my generation, if I understand what you're doing, how do I throw myself in agreement with you in what you're doing? That's the wisest thing we can do. It doesn't mean everyone has to go, but I believe we have to pray, we have to sow, we have to be invested, and many will go. But the question is, God, what are you highlighting in my generation? Because we don't want to just do our own thing. Right? We can, it's, like, it's like unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain. God's like, he's like, this is what I'm doing. I'm targeting the nations, that 1040 window, specifically the Middle East. It really is a brass heaven uh, over the Middle East with Islam. Hijacked that people group. And he goes, and if we understand that, and he goes, okay, Lord, how do I give myself to with, with what you're doing? In right? this time when we had, um, we had the 50 hours, what was different than the other times is that Jennifer said there was a lot more indigenous believers there. Okay? And what, what happened was it's these other, there's two other indigenous churches there, local churches, and their leaders came to it. One was associate pastor and another uh, elder, they came, and so the people came. And it was actually very different. It was really good. And it was local people that was, you know, sharing, praying, prophesying over their city, over their nation. And what was interesting is there was an associate pastor there, and he was older, and he was talking about these prophecies that, that they had visions while Saddam Hussein was alive still. So under his reign, so under Saddam's reign, what, do you guys know when Saddam was taken out? I think it was like 2003-ish. Okay, I think it was around that time. It was after 2001, for sure, right? I think it was around 2003-04, that, that time. So it was before that when he was there, and it was pretty close as a nation, and they, would, they had like a move of God, and they said God was speaking to them and showing them that revival would come, the move of the Spirit would come in the future. It would start in northern Iraq. It would start in the northern area, and it would go down south, all right, through the nation. And what God was speaking to them was saying, many different peoples would come and worship. Many different peoples would be saved. And, you know, he's in Erbil, okay, in that area. And uh, he said, he goes, we couldn't fathom not just the move of God, we couldn't fathom how many different peoples would come. Because at that time, it was only the people that lived there. All right? Now when we look, I mean, 20 years later, you have Erbil has become uh, a center, a city that's opened its borders for all types of refugees to come. They would have, they'd never, they were, they were going, how are other people going to come here? <laughs> like, you just can't fathom it. Okay? And now you look and go, the Yazidis, the Syrians, um, I mean, you, you have all these, and missionaries, laborers, right, are coming into Erbil, and they, he was sharing about the prophecies about how it would start in northern Iraq and go down. Now, Rick Ridings was there as well, who's uh, from Sakat Halal, you know, in uh, Israel. Ten years ago, they had the same vision about, it, about God starting in northern Iraq. Right? And then another, uh, David Bradshaw was there with Awaken the Dawn. Same thing. They had, they had this thing back then, uh, a little bit sooner, about it starting in the north. It was just really fascinating that like, these different peoples totally didn't know each other and separate going, God was speaking the same thing. Going, God is going to move in northern Iraq, and it will touch that entire nation. Right? And what we see here is that is like this, this uh, in Isaiah 42 it's part of a bigger picture of the Isaiah 19 highway where he says he will establish a singing bride through the Middle East. Right? And I believe that really is for our generation, for this generation, going God has a mandate over this generation. Right? And so, I mean, especially you young ones, I would say, you know, 
under 30 for sure. So, you know, it's that, like, hey, you guys listen. You guys listen to me? Especially you under 30s. It's like God is calling you guys, and you guys, and some of you will go, right? That you will go. You don't even know it. You don't even know it yet, and that's okay. But it's like, but the question to ask is going, God, what are you saying? What are you doing in my generation? What are you doing in my generation? And it's not to say that we, we don't want to, you know, God's not going to send people to South Africa, South America, or these other places. But I'm telling you, a lot of those places have been evangelized. And yes, we want to build a church. But it's like, but you look and there's this brass heaven and God's going, no, no, I'm focusing my energies on the people that have not heard the name of Jesus. It's part of the Matthew 28 gospel to go. And he's going to send. Right? And in Isaiah 42, he goes, this is what the servant is all about. <coughs> Beloved, you will be like the servant of the master servant. You will carry his heart and you'll be like him. And you will cry out and you will fight in the spirit right, for justice to prevail over these places because the greatest injustice for mankind, you know what the greatest injustice is? There's a couple things I think. Is one, they don't have the word of God in their language. They've never heard the word of God. Isn't that amazing? They've never heard the word of God. 40% of the earth has never heard the name of Jesus. So think about it. You have a sentence to death, and you've never heard of the person that can set you free. Total injustice. Right? It's, you know, you have a sentence to death, me, and you don't, and, and there's a cure, but you can, you have, you've never even heard of it. Not even have access to it. Not that you can't even buy it. You've never heard of it. Okay. And so there's different terms for it, Bible poverty, you know. Uh, uh, in, but the greatest injustice is going, oh, my goodness, in the West here, it's like we have, everyone has multiple Bibles, which we don't read. Right? I mean, you know, you look and you have, everyone has multiple Bibles that's got dust on it. We don't even open them for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, and there's TV programs and Internet and phones. And, I mean, there's so much of the Word of God that it's, you know, it just inundates us so much we don't even look at it. And you look and you go, over 40% of the nations, over 40% of the earth, it's like they have never heard the name of Jesus. And they don't have the Bible in their language. I mean, and so God's, God's, I believe he's going, I will send servants like my servant. Like the Isaiah 42 servant, he goes, I will send them into these places and they are going to fight and establish this justice, right? meaning the salvation and the hope and the peace and the love that his salvation brings, this justice he will establish. All right, let's stand together. And what I didn't really get to, and it's not in here, is all of this, there's, you know, we're looking at a big picture story, and all of this is unto the salvation of Israel. Right? So when we look at this, it's like you look at, the, you look at the Middle East, and we want to see the gospel go into the Middle East, for sure. And you look and go, but unto the salvation of Israel. Right? We never lose sight, because that's God's plan from the beginning. He goes, unto the salvation of Israel. It's the Romans 11. And so we always want to keep that in mind. Um, we'll talk probably about next week more, but we're going to, there's this big Isaiah 62 fast that's coming, a global fast that's coming for the salvation of Israel that we're going to participate in. Um, they, they believe there, there's, a hun- there's a million believers that are going to be praying for 21 days for the salvation of Israel. I mean, all these nation, you know, ministries. And so we're going to join in on that. Uh, we're going to do some special things. So we'll talk about next week. But like, but God's plan is going, if the Middle East sings and these nations sing, he goes, he knows the fullness of the Gentiles will come in and thus all Israel will be saved. It's Romans 11, verse 26. So the fullness of the Gentiles must come in because I'll respond to a singing bride through the nations. He goes, then he goes, all Israel will be saved. And so it's like, we look and go, God, your wisdom. Right? And here's a great part because doesn't cost us anything really much to be part of this 
to join into it. There's a huge sacrifice of comfort, huge sacrifice maybe of priorities, right? Things that, but honestly, we can all sing. We can all pray. Even Jim can sing. You know, it's like, right? It's not our voices going, look, how much do we want to enter in? That's the, that's the call going. It doesn't cost money. Right? It costs our time and priorities to enter into what he wants to do. All right, let's, let's just ask the Lord to come and just, let's just respond to him here. One moment. I say, Lord, thank you for your promise. This Isaiah 42, promise of your servant. The promise of servants to come. More than that, Lord, how the nations will sing. The nations will respond. The nations will love you, Jesus, including I ask you right now, Lord, come and touch us in our hearts, God. Lord, about your desire for the Middle East. I tell you, I mean, you guys, most of you guys know, like, we had no clue about it. Most of my adult life, I had no clue about the Middle East. And so it's not what we want or don't want. It's the Lord that opens the door, touches our hearts. It's his call. It's, it's what he wants. And so, Lord, we, I ask you for this, whether we know or don't know. And we might be just young kids that it doesn't even register. It's okay. Say, so, Lord, set your desire upon us. Set your desire upon us. Whether we agree or disagree, it's, not, it's irrelevant even. Set your desire upon us. The Spirit of God, what you're doing in the nations in this generation, Set your desire upon us right now. enter into our mind right now understanding desire conviction If you want more prayer, if you, you know, some of you know you're called or, or, or have a desire or an inkling or whatever, we can pray for you. But um, 
really want to just pray because I think a lot of the, our kids, our children, and young ones, um, and even not young ones, they don't know. And it's okay not, not to know. Right? And you might have different plans, and it's okay. Yeah, that's like, our God is a great leader. And he has plans over our lives in different seasons. And I want to pray for that. Like, desires will come. Ideas and understandings will come. And things, and we have no idea. I always used to tell our students, you have no idea where your life is going to go. You have no idea the places you're going to go, the people you're going to see. And so I want to pray for that because it really is, it's God's desire. And we submit under that. So I want to pray for that. And then if you guys want more prayer or prayer for healing, you can come up. All right, Father, we pray both for out of this generation right now and out of this house. Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would set your desire. Lord, what's burning on your heart, Lord. That these things, Lord, would enter into our spirits. We might not feel anything. We might not know or understand. But Spirit of God, come and deposit things inside of us. Lord, give us dreams. Lord, give us stories that we relate to. Lord, give us a picture. Let us see something. We say, oh, that, that, that just connects with us for whatever reason. We say, Lord, bear fruit, Lord. Your desire out of our hearts and out of our lives. No matter what age we're at or when it is or how we're connected, that's all up to you. I say, Lord, we want to say yes. Lord, we want to come into agreement, Lord, with what you're doing in the earth. Lord, whether we send, whether we go, whether we pray, Lord, whatever it is, we want to say yes to what you're doing. We say you are the greatest servant of all. And we want to come under your servanthood, Lord. And we want to carry that same mantle that you have. And as you're at the right hand of the Father, you're interceding and you're bringing forth your plan to the nations. We want to come under that servanthood right now that it would do something inside of us, Lord, whether we know it or not, we say, Spirit of God, come and touch us right now.